um, some version of our intelligence analysis will, um, there's a plan for Trump to start getting that while he's under criminal prosecution for mishandling classified documents. Will you explain what this is and, and, and what, what, what you think is likely to happen? Anna Nicole, it's uh, somewhat surreal that an individual who is under indictment for mishandling classified information is going to be getting classified intelligence briefings. But it, this traditionally is provided to the candidates for president uh, by the sitting president. Um, and so therefore, I think it makes sense for the Biden administration to offer that to Donald Trump. Now, I'm pretty certain that my former intelligence colleagues will provide briefings that are not going to do any type of damage to sources and methods uh, in terms of providing information to Donald Trump that he could misuse. But they will provide analytic overviews and briefings about some of the world's hotspots, uh, letting them letting uh, Donald Trump know what the assessments are at this point. So I think it's going to be analysis that will be devoid of the sources and methods, the sensitive things that we are most concerned about, the types of things that were in all those documents that he had in the bathroom and other areas in Mar-a-Lago. But I, I do think it makes sense. Now, it's a question about whether or not Donald Trump will accept the briefings. Uh, and I'm sure that if he does accept them, he probably will disparage them as he has disparaged U.S. intelligence officers as well as U.S. intelligence itself uh, for so long over so many years. I, I, not to be cute, but just to keep front of mind what he did the last time he had access to these state secrets, here he is showing war plans to, I think these were Mark Meadows uh, autobiographers. Well, with Millie, uh, let me see that. I'll show you an example. He said that I wanted to attack Iran. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. Look. This was him. They presented me this. This is off the record, but they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. Wow. We looked at some. This was him. This wasn't done by me. This was him. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. It's pages long. Look. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's see here. He's in the papers. Wow. This was done by the military, given to me. Uh, I think we can probably. Yeah? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to figure out. A, a, yeah. See, as president, I could have detlessed. Yeah. Uh, now I can't. You know, but this is. Yeah, no, no. So whether he's ever convicted for those alleged felony crimes is. TBD, um, but there he is on tape doing the deed. And, and I wonder, I mean, even analysis has value. That's why since 1952, that valuable information has been shared with the two people on the belief that if one of them becomes president, they'll be better prepared on day one if they have this understanding. I mean, how do you, how, what is the predicate for giving it to Trump? Well, I think the predicate is that all other candidates for the office of the presidency have been offered that type of briefing. But again, I would think that the briefing that is given to Donald Trump will be at the, at most at the at the secret level. Um, it's not going to involve any type of top secret information, uh, source of methods. There are not going to be any documents that are going to be provided to him. It's going to be an oral briefing, an assessment, something similar to what the intelligence community leaders do every year in front of Congress in terms of a worldwide threat assessment. And so I think that's what they're going to do. Uh, they're not going to get uh, into any type of detail. Uh, so I. I I do think it it's, uh, makes sense for, again, the Biden administration to offer this to Trump uh, and uh, making sure that he's not going to be able to do any damage uh, with it other than just, again, denigrating the work of the U.S. intelligence community. You know, Charlie Sykes, I'm always, um, I, I've always noted sort of the, the shift in the Overton window. And when you step away and come back, it's even more stark. So that the frame we have again around it is we're doing something that we've always done because the institutions and the norms must hold. This is sort of in President Joe Biden's DNA. It's why he won't touch Supreme Court reform. This is in the DNA of the Democratic Party, this, this um, honoring of, of institutions and norms. And the idea that Sue Gordon sat right where David Plouffe is sitting two days ago and, and basically said that, that anyone who sees the world and treats American democracy and American national security the way Trump does should be disqualified. Um, it's these two clanging realities, you know, Earth One and Earth Two is how we shorthand it around here. But to sit down with Viktor Orban 
and just share what he already knows, t to me, is, is a threat in and of itself. Well, everything about Donald Trump is a threat in and of itself, you know. And with, uh, you know, I, I defer to the director about what the traditions and the and the norms are, but I, I think the Biden administration would be well within its rights to say, uh, no, we are not uh, going to give uh, secret uh, briefings uh, to to Donald Trump, somebody who is actually under indictment for misusing uh, government secrets, who is under indictment for defrauding the government, et, 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 et cetera, because at some point. You have to say this contrast, and we're going to see, obviously, I think President Biden later tonight, you know, draw, draw this contrast. This contrast is not the normal political contrast. This is not a normal, traditional political race where we simply disagree about some of the issues. This is a fundamental question about Donald Trump's qualifications and fitness for office. And one way to do that, and again, I, I'm not going to get into the, uh, you know, get into the nuances of it, but, but one way to do that is to say, no, we're not going to treat him like every other presidential candidate. Now, obviously, there would be some blowback to that. But, you know, there, there, are, there are moments where you draw the line and say, look, we are, we are not going to give the nation secrets to somebody who is basically a shill for Vladimir Putin and who is meeting with our enemies and who does on a routine basis disparage U.S. intelligence, uh, the uh, intelligence uh, world. So, David Plouffe, um, I know political, so, so when I worked on the McCain campaign, John McCain would talk almost every day to Saakashvili, and um, one day he went to an arena um, in a battleground state and said, today we are all Georgians. And I don't know how many people were following Putin's march and, and aggressions. Um, and, and he was with Lieberman and Lindsey Graham, and so they all, you know, raised their arms. And, and, and all of the campaign staff just cringed. You know, this was foreign policy in the final weeks of—and and, and I wonder—but I wonder how you, you think, as a country— how far along we are in this effort, very successful by Democratic leaders like Josh Shapiro and Governor Whitmer and President Joe Biden in the midterms, of knitting these things together, this fight for democracy at home, protecting it abroad, and things that usually we talk about as kitchen table issues. Nicole, I remember that day well. But <laughs> um, we died a thousand deaths. Uh, we were like, that wasn't in the speech. <laughs> uh, but I think that, well, the, the coalition that needs to be stitched together here to get the 270 electoral votes is going to take a lot of different people who disagree on a lot of different issues, but come together around the fact that we don't want to throw rose petals in front of someone like Vladimir Putin, that American democracy is worth fighting for. We've got to explain what that means. I think that shorthand doesn't work. I think you have to paint what it would mean if Donald Trump were to win. And, you know, using the judiciary and basically disregarding norms, what that would mean to average people. So that's the task of the next basically little less than eight months is to find enough people. Uh, and it's going to require Republicans and it's going to require conservative leaning independents. It's going to require young people who may not be thrilled Joe Biden's the nominee. But I think tonight's a big night because it's going to be his biggest direct audience probably until the first debate, assuming we have one. So uh, you really have to maximize this. And obviously with social media, you can reach a lot of people who don't watch the speech tonight, which most people won't. So I think that contrast, we're going to hear a lot about the contrast you let off with, that it's incredibly important. Yes, Biden's got to, I don't know if he can win the straight up question on who do you trust more on the economy, mm -hmm. but he's got to get that number closer and mm -hmm. then take advantage of things like democracy, women's health care, climate change, all the issues where he has an issue advantage. And you, do you think that, that this election is still one that we look at in that way? I mean, I remember looking at the strong leader numbers. They were determinative in 2004, and numbers on, on economy and uh, retirement and health care. And, I mean, is, is, that still, is that still where we are, or do you think there's a gut thing, or do you think it's all the above? Well, I think Biden does have a challenge, which is we see from the polls people are concerned about his age, and is he up to this? And so I think tonight's a good opportunity. Every day is a good opportunity to go out there. I think he is being more visible. And more visible doesn't just mean taking questions from the press. It's being on TikTok. It's being on Instagram. It's mm -hmm. just being out there. So I do think he's got to provide more comfort on that. But at the end of the day, the way where I see this election, Trump has a lead. Now, these are polls in March, so we should be careful about overinterpreting him. But my sense is Trump is closer to his ceiling. So most of these polls in a state or nationally have 87 or 88 percent of the vote allocated. 
I think most of that will go to Biden, assuming they vote. Mm -hmm. So this is a winnable race, but I think Biden has to convince people that he's up for this challenge. And that's why the debates are going to be important, because if he can stand up to Trump and kind of push him around a little bit, mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And then we've seen that abortion has driven, and it's now become even more so with things like IVF, the Speaker of the House with some strange comments today on that, I think will drive vote. But I think that um, this is going to be really, really close. Uh, and because it's every close, every moment matters. You can't squander one. So tonight, even though you don't get the ratings you're used to, that's the biggest audience he's going to directly face for a very long time. As Steve is talking, I'm remembering that you know, there's always a natural tension between the communicators and the and the campaign managers. So Ken Melman and, and Matt Dowd had had jobs like David's and responsibilities like his, and they, they were in the data and they knew everything. And then people like me and McKinnon kind of had our heads in the clouds. Like, and, and so from the on the gut level, you, you feel like you could just see Biden saying, "Come on, man, this is the new we are." And even if you're a lifelong Republican, if your kid comes out and is a dissident and protests the government, he's modeling. He's going to model our government after Russia. And look what happened to Navalny. I mean, there's a gut yeah. argument that you could make, and I'm sure there is a natural tension in the White House about how much time to spend on who we are, soul of the nation, protecting democracy, and some of these other things that maybe tighten uh, the, the, we call them silos in the press office, but these boxes and these metrics that, that drive vote in a presidential year. Listen, I, I, I honestly believe what he says tonight is not as important as how he says it. Mm. I think he has to have a tone of feisty and aggressive. And yeah. off the cuff, didn't he? And then he's yeah, ready like a for great this moment, fight. You know, yeah. That he knows this is a fight, and it's a fight worth making, and he's ready to fight. And that's why I think this idea of giving uh, Trump intelligence briefings is a miss. They shouldn't it's be doing crazy. that. Crazy. They shouldn't be doing that. You know why? Because this is an opportunity to point out again that, yeah, normally we would, but this isn't normal. No one who should be indicted, who's been indicted for stealing nuclear secrets from the White House and who purposely kept them from the intelligence community afterwards, much less the fact that he trashed the intelligence community his entire term in office, they shouldn't be getting secret briefings. And this would